So why don't we open our Bibles and maybe grab our favorite cup of coffee and uh, turn to First jo John chapter 3 as we continue to make our way through this awesome epistle here written by the last living apostle. Um, and as we uh, turn our attention to verses 1 and 2 today, uh, John writes these words, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, <clears throat> and what we will be has not yet been or has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. Uh, behold what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God. Uh, some of your versions there say sons in that. It's important for us to recognize that in the New Testament, when we see sons as the uh, term that is used, um, that we don't see it as sort of a sexist thing, but rather what's in view here is the idea of sonship, the idea of inheritance, the idea of um, well, again, standing to inherit from the Father. This is something that was typically in that patriarchal uh, society was, was pretty much destined for sons. Uh, in some occasions, if there were no sons, a, a daughter might stand to inherit then. But if there were sons, the son would be the one who would inherit. And so uh, rather than separating uh, uh, sons and daughters here, what's actually in view is the idea that as children of God, we all stand to inherit uh, as his children. It's... Um, you know, if I can borrow from Paul's writing in the Galatians and elsewhere, where he said, uh, there's no longer male nor female, slave nor free, etc., those kinds of things. But rather, in Christ, we find that we're on equal footing in our relationship with him. That doesn't diminish the roles and places that God has designed for families and things like that. But, but really, in terms of our standing before him, there is no longer a, a distinction in that regard. We all, as children of God, stand to inherit. Uh, so he says, sons of God... Uh, or in, in uh, some of the versions like mine, says children of God in that. The idea there is broader than just a male figure. It's actually the children that are ultimately in view. But really what's even greater in view is the gift that is given to us, and that is the love of God. Uh, if we understand the gospel, we understand that we were at enmity with God. We were enemies of God. All have sinned or rebelled against God and have fallen short of the glory of God. And so therefore, to receive God's love as a gift, the way John talks about it, the way Paul talks about it, that which we can uh, never be separated from, neither height nor depth, nor any created thing, all of that. Uh, in uh, Romans chapter uh, 8, we understand that we are, we are recipients of something that cannot be taken away, and the grandness of that gift cannot be overstated. <clears throat> and frankly, too often is underestimated um, or and understated. The love of God is is not just this syrupy, gooey uh, kind of thing, but rather it is uh, it is something that is given to us in spite of the fact that we could not possibly be more unworthy of it. Uh, it's it's um, yeah. We sometimes try to think of analogies for this, and it's a little difficult. You know, we. Um, you know, we hear stories of maybe the, the puppy on the side of the road that's all beat up and waterlogged and just just a pathetic thing. And then out of this sense of mercy and awe and just this kind of love for this creature wells up within us and we take it in. That's a cool picture. And, and that maybe, you know, talks about mercy and, and even love to some degree. But that puppy never did anything to spite us. Maybe a better analogy would be that we have a dog that continues to bite us and gnaw at us and chew up our furniture, and but yet somehow still we manage to demonstrate love for this thing, and we have love for this thing. That would be closer to the truth. Um, but then you add on top of that, uh, we talked about this uh, a little bit on, um, I think on Good Friday, maybe our last Wednesday night at our uh, discussion on the Sermon on the Mount, but you know, God from all eternity has known our rebellion against him. And yet, nonetheless, he doesn't muster up love for us. His nature being love uh, and, and the fact that he would give that to us. These are overwhelming thoughts and things to, that we do well to think about, to dwell upon. Um, and it's given to us. And we call the children of God. Uh, no longer children of the devil. Uh, no longer... Um, any of the lesser things that we could be considered children of, but rather children of God, God, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords, the creator of the universe, we're his now. And, uh, and, and that kind of gives pronounced meaning to when, uh, when Jesus uh, teaches us to pray. And he says, 
uh, our Father in heaven, right? The idea of that very intimate daddy kind of term that he uses there that uh, speaks of, you know, not being afraid but coming and, and, and drawing close to him as a child. Um, when the author of Hebrews talks about coming boldly before the throne of grace to obtain mercy in our time of need, that is not something that, um, that a child of the devil could, you know, uh, could so confidently enter into or have any right to. But as children, we do. And so therefore we, um, we do, we come. We expect that and understand that from our experience now walking with him, that God loves us and cares for us and provides for us and longs for us to come close to him. But that's not because of us. It's because of his great love that he has for us. And therefore, behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called the sons of God, the children of God. Um, and that is what we are. Now, that's what we are, present tense. It's not something that we, um, we put our faith in Christ and then we live up to a certain standard and then we become the children of God. No, it's something we are positionally from the moment we come to faith. In one sense, when we talk about the children of God, it's important to remember that in one sense, all human beings uh, are image bearers in a sense of God. We're all children of God by creation and that kind of thing. But in, in Jesus' own ministry, when uh, squaring off against the religious leaders uh, and they were accusing him, I believe this was the, the instance that, provo- that, that provoked this response or that prodded this from, uh, for the Lord to respond with, but they, uh, they were accusing him of being illegitimate, a bastard son. You know, we were not born of fornication like you were, is what they were saying. And Jesus would go on to talk to them about how they were of their father, the devil. And uh, of course, that, you know, didn't score many points in their regard, but that was not the point anyway. But in that exchange, in those words of Jesus, we see that there is, in fact, a very real sense in which there are two fathers that you could belong to. Uh, There, of course, is God the Father, but then, of course, as Jesus tells them, those who are rebellious against him, who hate him and want to destroy him, they are children of their father, the devil. In other words, they are sort of the image bearers of their father in in the way they act, behave, and believe, and and, uh, and all these kinds of things. And so, um, but here we are, as believers in Christ now, positionally as children of God. Um, And just allow that breathtaking truth to to consume you, to captivate you. Um, you know, we ought to. Uh, this is, you know, when we see him face to face and we just are blown away by who he is and we, and we fall on our faces and we worship and that kind of thing, don't let that be a new experience then. Think about these things even now in time and space because one day, um, you know, as we think about it, sometimes we'll find even today ourselves kind of brought to that place of just humble adoration Uh, and thanksgiving as we consider these truths. So often we just sort of read through them kind of quickly and don't really take time to consider what is being said there, um, at least in any meaningful, deeper, weighty kind of way. Uh, Again, the reason why the world does not know us, John is saying the reason that the world does not know us, and of course know us doesn't mean that they don't see us or know our names or see what we do, but they are not part of us. They're not, um, you know, they don't acknowledge us as being you know, good and right and all these things, they are some completely apart from us because we have a very different understanding. We have a different relationship with God. And they're not of us, as John uh, had said earlier in his letter. The reason why the world does not know us is that they did not know, it did not know him. And of course, that is the reason. Um, Jesus would talk about uh, the sheep and the goats and how those who, um, or not the sheep and the goats, rather, but uh, in Matthew chapter 7, when he talked about uh, those who did all these great works in his name and that. But yet he told them to depart because he never knew them. Uh, they may have been very religious, but there was never an actual relationship there with him. And the reason there was not a relationship, much like here what John is describing, the reason there is no relationship uh, with, with, uh, with Christ on, on behalf of those who don't believe is because they just reject. They don't want to submit to him. They don't want to follow him. They uh, many will get close and want sort of a version of Jesus that sort of gives them a sense and a feeling of spirituality, but they don't really want to follow the actual Jesus. They don't want to bend the knee to him. They don't want to take up their cross and follow after him, but rather they just sort of want to have the life that they want and sort of a little bit of religion too to make them feel better. Um, but that's not a relationship with him. That's not knowing him. And, uh, and as a result of that, those that reject him don't know him have the same sort of mindset 
toward those who follow Christ. And so uh, John here is talking to believers about this idea in the midst of persecution and things like this and helping them to realize and understand why it is that they are facing such hostility. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> he goes on in verse 2 and uh, says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when, we, when he appears, we'll, uh, uh, we shall be like him because we'll see him as he is. <clears throat> now, this, <clears throat> this is actually really good timing that we came to this passage because just a few days ago, uh, in our comment section, a question was raised. What about our glorified bodies? Will we be invisible like spirits or will we people see us? What will our glorified bodies be like? I think that was kind of at the heart of that question. And so this is a perfect opportunity to speak to that a little bit. <clears throat> now, John says we are children of God even right now in our current state, fallen as we even are in our flesh and this kind of thing, now redeemed in Christ, and we are children of God in Christ. <clears throat> but there is still something, <clears throat> excuse me, there is still something that is yet to come in regard to what we shall be. Now, what's that all about? Well, Paul actually talks about this kind of thing in great detail. He talks, as a matter of fact, why don't we turn to... Um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> well, I don't know what's going on with that. <sighs> See how that goes. <clears throat> so in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about um, what we shall be, what we're ultimately going to become in the... <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Wow, I don't know what's... <clears throat> I really apologize for that. I think we're better now. <clears throat> what we will be in the days to come. So uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, in particular, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn our attention to verse 35 to begin to look at what Paul says about these, um, our bodies, what we're going to ultimately morph into one day, if I can put it that way. It's actually not an inappropriate way to put it because it's, uh, as Paul describes it, it is, um, and as John talked about it, we'll be like him, we'll see him as he is and all. Um, when, <clears throat> when Jesus was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17 and, and the other Gospels that talk about it, um, the word there for transformation is where we get our word metamorph or uh, transfiguration is where we get our word metamorphosis from. And so the idea of morphing, the idea in, in, in Jesus' case, it was this sort of unveiling of his genuine real glory uh, that was sort of hidden behind uh, his flesh, as it were. It's uh, in Philippians chapter two. It speaks about how he kind of set aside his glory for that time to take on a body of flesh, ultimately to go to the cross. Um, but he was never he never ceased to be God during the entire uh, time that he was uh, incarnate, dwelling on the earth. But rather, in that moment, what happened was it's like sort of the real person of Christ just sort of burst through. Uh, that that flesh that he had been dwelling in during that time for just that moment, so that Peter and James and John could see him. It's interesting that you know John, who is writing the first epistle uh, and who sees Jesus in the Revelation again, saw Jesus in this transfiguration. And so when John says, "What we shall be has not yet appeared, but we know that when we see him, we'll be like him." Uh, and so, having seen Jesus in the transfiguration, some picture of that must be in his mind. Well, Paul elaborates on this um, earlier. I mean, John writes later than Paul, but Paul here speaks to this in much more detail uh, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. In verse 35, he says, But someone will ask, How are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but is a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he's chosen, and to each kind of seed, it's uh, seed, its uh, its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind of humans, another of animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is one kind, and the glory of the earthly is another. Uh, there is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For stars differ uh, from star and glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, but what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It's sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living being, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. 
But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. Now this is true for us. It's different for Jesus, who took on a body of flesh in the incarnation. But we are different. We're born first uh, in the flesh, and we ultimately are born again. And, uh, and this now is speaking to us in this condition. Um, so nowhere in here is the idea, as we compare what, we, what our glorified bodies are like Jesus' body in, in some sense, in no way should we take from this that we also started in some, or we can't take from this. This actually speaks to the idea that we don't start a spiritual being, but rather we start a flesh being who ultimately becomes uh, uh, raised in power uh, in that. So, um, you know, the, in other words, there's no pre-existence of souls and that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, uh, again, verse uh, 47 uh, the first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And uh, as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery, something that was not clear before, but now he's making clear. Uh, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In a moment, uh, or we shall, uh, behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. When, we, uh, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death, where, uh, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? And so, and he goes on to speak about how the sting of sin is death and so on. Um, and so he speaks here about this glorified body. And the way he talks about it, we're talking about, uh, he, re, he re refers to it as being, there, there, are, there are elements that continue into the new, just like in a seed. The seed goes into the ground and it does not, come out of the ground the same as it went in, but nonetheless what was, there was something intrinsic to that seed that is present in the, in the expression and flowering of that which comes out of the ground. Well, the resurrection is like this for us, our glorified bodies. We're still us, but there is a new kind of body that is in view. Um, now, again, this uh, Paul's using analogies here to help us understand concepts. He's, um, you know, a seed is a material thing, and it comes up a material thing that is, you know, earthy and that kind of thing. But it's different. Um, you know, uh, the caterpillar attaches itself to the plant, but emerges a butterfly and that kind of thing. It's still the same creature or being in a sense, but it is now metamorphosed. Uh, it's morphed. It's it's transformed. Well, in the same way, the, glory, the, the, the body goes into the ground, we die, or <clears throat> as Paul talks about here, even um, uh, between this and, and 1 Corinthians chapter 4, or 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he refers to the rapture and the idea that for some, in that moment, the change takes place. For others who have died, or who die before the, the rapture comes, they go into the ground and they come forth in the resurrection with their glorified bodies. The being that went into the ground, the person inside this shell of flesh is with the Lord when we die. But nonetheless, we are now reunited with our bodies, but not the same thing that's, that went into the ground per se, but now a glorified body. Um, that body is no longer in the ground, but it is transformed. It, is, it, met, it has, goes through a metamorphosis and ultimately becomes this glorified body. And it, it becomes immortal. And, and of course, the example of this that we point to, first and foremost, is Jesus. Jesus was crucified, he went into the grave, and he, in his body, came out of the grave. Yet, his body was different than when it went in. Uh, his, his, in other words, his physical body did not uh, continue to, to be in the tomb, and he just sort of spiritually rose, but he bodily rose from the dead. Uh, but yet, his body was different. Uh, he could appear in the upper room without opening a door. Um, and when they saw him, they thought they were seeing a spirit, the disciples, as it says in, in Luke's account of the uh, post-resurrection appearance in the upper room. And Jesus says to them, why do you think you're looking at a spirit? Does a spirit have flesh and bone like I have? It's interesting, when you compare what Jesus said there with what Paul said here, flesh and bone is what Jesus claimed to have there. It, it didn't, he didn't say blood. 
Here in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. In other words, there's something mortal about that, not immortal about that. Um, in, in our bodies now, as the scriptures say, the life is in the blood. Is there something different in that regard in our glorified bodies? Do we have blood the way we think of it now? Is our, our bodies are physical. And I think that primarily is all Jesus was mostly saying in the upper room is that, um, that I'm physically here with you. I'm not just a spirit. But yet his body had properties that were different than the properties of our physical bodies. Um, he couldn't just vanish, or he could just vanish. We can't just vanish. Um, he could, again, show up in a room without opening a door. We can't do that yet in our current bodies. And so there is something, uh, so I, and in part to, uh, to continue to answer specifically the question that was asked in this regard, um, there is clearly the ability to see and to even touch a week later, you know, in, in that upper room appearance. You know, Thomas wasn't there in that first appearance, but a week later, Thomas is there and Jesus invites him to come and to put his hand in the, you know, more likely here, but the nail prints in his hands uh, and to put his hand in his side. Um, wow. Okay. So he's physically there and you could touch him. He ate in front of them. Do you have a piece of fish? And he ate in front of them so they could see that he was physically there. So, uh, and of course we eat from the tree of life in the, in, in uh, you know, in eternity as well. But but in terms of interacting with each other, Jesus was seen by the disciples by over 500 at one time, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians, uh, earlier in chapter 15. <clears throat> um, uh, there's this eerie passage in Matthew that after Jesus rose from the dead, the bodies of many who had died rose up and were walking around Jerusalem and, uh, and that kind of thing, and people clearly saw it. Uh, and so, um, so we can take from this um, that even though there is something fundamentally different about uh, our bodies after we rise uh, in glory, they are still physical in some sense. Um, then can be touched. They could, people will be able to hear us and see us. We'll be able to interact with people. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, in uh, uh, Revelation twenty, where uh, the millennial kingdom takes place, and those who have risen are with him, um, they rule and reign on thrones alongside. We rule and reign with Christ. Well, there's a very f- assumed, a very, you know, visible element to that where people can see and hear us as we do that which Christ would have us do in those positions and roles during that time. So yeah, my, my, my answer to that question, and I believe this is what the scriptures are teaching, is that our glorified bodies will still be physical, although different fundamentally than these, uh, these shells that we walk around in now, um, but they will be physical. And we'll be able to interact with people during the millennium. Uh, and uh, we don't transform yet again when we go to heaven. And so somehow this is now the new and far improved and perfect version that, uh, that, uh, that we now become at that point. So anyway, so when getting back to 1 John, we, you know, what, we, what we shall be has not yet appeared. In other words, we're not yet in that state. But we know that when we see him, we'll be like him for we'll see him as he is. Uh, and so we have much to look forward to in that regard. Um, you know, and so in, in, and of course, Paul's argument and, and probably implicit in John's too, is that we need not fear, uh, what comes upon us in terms of death and that kind of thing. And, and even as a believer, I, I, on the one hand, I look forward to being with the Lord. I don't necessarily, however, look forward to the process by which that might happen. You know, if, uh, I, I, you know, no one, no one should be excited about the event of dying per se and how it may happen. You know, it could be horrible, but what, you know, whatever, but it's just for a moment and then you're in eternity. And that's the part that we look forward to. Um, and we don't need to fear it. We don't need to be afraid of it, even though we don't have all the details of everything that it will be like when we ultimately go and enter into our glorified state. And when we move into the millennium and then into eternity, we don't have all the details of what that will always be, uh, what that'll be about. But we are encouraged throughout Scripture on this subject to not be in fear about it, not to be uh, resistant to it, but to see it as uh, as a as an enormous paradigm shift forward, a quantum leap, uh, and maybe quantum is the right word, you know, uh, uh, in some sense. But there is something about that transformation that takes place that is something to be looked forward to with great anticipation and not to be feared in any way, uh, because we'll be like him. And so, 
uh, just a beautiful, beautiful passage to consider, both in 1 John chapter 3, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, by the way, on the subject of the resurrection, uh, is really second to none in describing the importance of the resurrection, um, the reality of the resurrection, the evidence for the resurrection, what the resurrection means in regard to our glorification and those kinds of things. Uh, it's such a rich passage that ought to be studied over and over and over again, just so we understand all the implications of the resurrection, so that we wouldn't see the resurrection, both of Christ and even of ourselves later, uh, as being some sort of peripheral thing to our faith. It's actually a very central element, both of our belief in the resurrection of Christ, but also uh, in looking forward to, to our reward, that, that which has just been promised to us as believers, this transformation. It's not just about things that, like crowns that will be, you know, given and reward and that kind of thing, but rather even what we become is a bit of reward as well, as we now have bodies fit for heaven. And so um, hopefully that answers the question that came up, and hopefully also it gives us a sense, again, of just the richness of this topic and of the passages that deal with it. They are definitely worthy of our time and consideration. Now, I only covered the first two passages of 1 John chapter 3. Next time we're in 1 John, uh, we'll begin to talk about um, sort of the outworking of that expectation that John goes on to talk about. So uh, more on that next time. But Father, we thank you and praise you for your word, uh, the rich promises that are there, the explanations that are there, that even though we don't get every single detail of how things will be, we have enough to know that it is surely good. And we just pray that you'd help us to, um, in spite of our tendency to fear the unknown, to pour ourselves into what we can know about these things from your word. And even when we come to the end of what the scripture says about it, and we are left to sort of wonder what might be next, help us not to fear it, because ultimately you're the source of these things. You are the giver of these things. Uh, you are the end of all of these things. You are the purpose and the end of our faith. You're everything that we look forward to and, and, and hinge and pin our hopes to and everything. And, and one day when we're passing away from this life. Uh, as it's been said, we leave behind the surly bonds of earth and ultimately go to be with you. Uh, Father, this will be the glorious time that we have been made for and <clears throat> that hopefully every day as we walk with you, we look all the more forward to. Thank you, Lord, for the great love, the shocking, uh, undeserved love that you give us, uh, the love that is given in spite of who we are and what we've done. Uh, nonetheless, yet, uh, you now, in your great love that you've given to us, you've made us your children as believers. And so we thank you for this. Help us to rest in this, to bask in it. And as John will talk about, help it to affect and impact the way that we live in response as we look forward to seeing Jesus coming for us. So thank you, Father, for all of these things. And again, thank you for your word that helps us to know and understand ideas like these. We praise you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have any questions, thoughts, comments, please feel free to leave them here on our YouTube channel. Or if you want to go to my website at parsonspad.com, you can watch these videos there. You can comment there. Uh, you can also email me from there at brian at parsonspad.com. It's Brian with an I. I did not grow up with parents that were hip enough to use a Y, but it's B-R-I-A-N at parsonspad.com. Uh, you can also learn about our church at Calvary Chapel Franklin. And uh, if you are ever in the area and want to come by and pay us a visit, we invite you to do that. Come and go through the Word with us on a Sunday morning uh, or a Wednesday night, which, by the way, we've also begun live streaming on our YouTube channel. So if you subscribe to this channel, I think I'm pointing at the subscribe button, but if you subscribe to our channel, you can uh, be alerted to our Wednesday night services that start at 7 o'clock. And uh, you can watch our current study on the Sermon on the Mount as we're doing it. Uh, and also, we um, uh, not every time, but uh, usually we've got somebody there kind of watching the comments section on our live stream so that if you have questions while we're going through it, even though you may not be able to be personally there with us, you, in a sense, kind of still can be by participating in that. And so uh, that's been kind of fun to experiment with, and, and um, we're going to try and keep doing that going forward. Uh, I'm aware of many that, that watch that, that don't have a home fellowship or don't have a Bible teaching church nearby. And so we're glad to have you, at least in this sense, as, as part of our church family, you know, as, as, as part of the body of Christ. There's a way we can still interact this way. So encourage that as well. But thanks for watching, and we'll look forward to catching up with you next time. And uh, until then, may the Lord bless and keep you and make his face shine upon you and give you peace. God bless you.